Hello, I'm Barry Silverberg, Director of the Center for Nonprofit Studies at Austin Community College. Welcome to Civil Society, where we explore issues affecting our communal well being through a nonprofit lens. We're a proud partner of ACC TV. My guest today is Shana Fox. She has been with the Council on At Risk Youth for over 12 years, the last four as its Executive Director. Previously, she was Carrie's Deputy Director. While in the Texas State Graduate Program in Social Work, she visited a juvenile justice facility and saw firsthand what happens to youth when they're locked up. Her focus on vulnerable populations and social justice, along with this pivotal experience, led her to commit herself to her current career, seeking to change the trend of at-risk youth becoming involved in the pipeline to prison. I first met Shana when she was a member of our Certificate in Nonprofit Leadership and Management, Class of 2014. Her mentor, Adrian Moore, founder of the Council on Net Risk Youth, shared his sense that Shana had great promise as a nonprofit professional and leader. That became self-evident during the certificate program, and again, when Adrian supported her to succeed him to lead and manage Carrie. Shana, I'm thrilled to welcome you as my guest, uh, it's a pleasure to see you, and thank you for all the work that you're doing to help thousands of at-risk youth. It's very important work. I want to start by asking you, so you're relatively young. Why are you doing this? Uh, first off, Barry, thank you for having me. Thanks for allowing some space to talk about uh, Carrie, the work that we do. Um, and yeah, I'm a lot less young than when I started. So, so we all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So um, I'm compelled to do this work for, uh, for two major reasons. One is giving voice to students, to kids that may otherwise just never have that opportunity. And number two, because I am driven by my community. Um, I've always been really passionate about that which surrounds me and wanting to help out in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. um, specifically with youth, because I think there's a real opportunity to dive into prevention, giving, uh, giving kids an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So when we start, put a context, what is it that Carrie does? Yeah, excellent question, and thank you for asking. Um, so Carrie- Only good questions <laughs> on this show. The Council on At-Risk Youth, um, our mission is to empower at-risk youth with the skills to um, stay out of crime and violence themselves, right? And so what we do that's like none other nonprofit in Austin um, is focus on students that are deeply entrenched in the uh, disciplinary system at school. So we work with students that have the highest likelihood of entering not into college or into the trade, but into the pipeline to prison. And so we identify those students early on, uh, which is a powerful predictor of them being involved in the criminal justice system, is them being involved in the disciplinary system. The same kids that are being removed from school, mm -hmm. that are being suspended or expelled, are likely the same kids that are going to end up uh, behind bars. And so we have a really unique opportunity with this agency to get in front of that issue and to give s skills and opportunities to the families and to the students that we get to serve mm -hmm. to give them the skills to keep themselves out of, out of juvenile justice. And you, you find these kids, the school identifies them, um, or some of these kids identified through the criminal justice system? Uh. Yeah, so um, there's a couple different ways that kids can get involved. Uh, we are a school-based program, so uh, we've got 13 counselors serving 13 different schools around Central Texas. Each, um, each school has about 100 students on their caseload, and in order to be in our program, <coughs> those students must have had at least one serious behavioral incident at school, right? So. Mostly they're school referrals. Uh, we can also take referrals from outside. Sometimes we'll just have kids self-refer and say, hey, I want to mm -hmm. be, be in your program. I've seen that it's really working well for my friend. Um, as long as they have one documented serious incident, they can come and work with us. So you assume the role as executive director after four, uh, four, eight years of working with Adrian, I assume. Mm -hmm. and, and before that, you were in graduate school. Yes, sir. So what did it feel like? getting the big job. The big job? Sure, I mean, that's a great question. Um, so I originally went to school for social work, never thinking that I was wanting to, you know, be a policymaker or get involved in executive management. None of that really even crossed my path until 2014 when I got involved with, uh, with your program. Um, and uh, to be honest, I was really, really excited about the opportunity being uh, a young executive um, and 
being able to further the mission of Carrie because I believed in it. Having been a social worker directly working with mm -hmm. kids for eight years, I knew the impact. I knew the outcomes. I knew that this this program worked. Um, I did not know what I know now, of course, but um, yeah, I was I was extremely excited. I knew it was an opportunity to uh, to really grow professionally and personally. So was it was it aside from the excitement? Was it did you have concerns about moving from a staff role to being the person in charge of the entire operation? Yeah, I, I mean, I had some concerns, which um, I think have now been validated. Uh, my biggest concern was that I would be pulled away from clients, right? So I wouldn't be doing that direct work with, with kids day to day. Um, and that, that is the case. Um, however, what I've been able to enjoy is the, um, the part of being able to create opportunities for more people to come and work with more kids. So while I might not be the one directly working on, you know, on a school campus with, with kids every day, I'm still the conduit uh, to make sure that other people can. So one of the pivotal experiences that you had uh, that you expressed in your online bio, and we mentioned in the beginning uh, in your intro, was going to visit kids uh, in a prison for the first, I assume it was the first time. Sure. So what did that feel like? What did it seem like? Um, what did you hear? Uh, oh. Gosh, so I remember that it left an indelible imprint on on me, obviously. This is, a, it was a turning point for, for me in multiple ways. Number one, I did not know that we did this as a society, as a civil society, that we locked kids up. Um, and then the, the next thing I quickly realized was, gosh, we can do better than this. Um, you know, not even just from a, an investment point of view, but from a humanitarian point of view. To see 13, 14 year olds locked up um, just really, really affected me on a personal, personal level. And I think that was pretty much the day that I committed myself professionally to working with uh, kids, keeping them out of the system. Uh, yeah. when, you, when you went to the, to the prison, was the Garden of Bets or uh, another place? It was actually um, the Gidding State School. Oh, okay. Were, were they literally behind, uh, were they literally, was there bars, was there, you know, security system obviously? And yeah, so, you know. Did you um, feel, did you feel um, that you were there with them when you went through the security system? Yeah, I definitely, um, I, I felt like, uh, you know, they're, they're in sweatsuits, they're, you know, they're not in full out like orange, you know, stripes or anything right. like that, and they stay in bunks, but it is a highly restrictive environment. And so everything that I had been taught and really believed as far as, you know, restorative justice and, mm -hmm. um, and empowering our youth, it just felt like um, was taken away in that in that facility, right? They they don't have a whole lot of opportunities. They did have some really cool um, kind of uh, employment uh, kind of um, opportunities for kids to learn mm -hmm. about mechanics and and different things like that. But at the end of the day, it just didn't seem like the best use of our tax dollars, um, the opportunities for kids to thrive and learn and grow, uh, but. So knowing, having experienced or observed what happens to kids who get in that pipeline to prison, I'm sure that there are some cases that you and your staff work on where things don't work out. Sure. And a, a kid ends up in that pipeline. Sure. How do you all handle that? Well, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, think about ourselves as adults, right? When we try to correct a behavior like quitting smoking or, or, or not speeding or, you know, whatever it is, you know, cutting sugar out of our diet. Think of how hard it is for us. Let, let's keep, let's not get that far. Okay. But as, as kids, they're in the middle of some serious life changes, right? And so I don't know if you could pay me to go back to middle school. But <laughs> when, you know, when you think about, you know, that there is an opportunity to intervene on the front end, there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it. That's really where where it kind of starts and ends from my perspective. So what, what do you and your staff do when, when you do all you can and it just doesn't work? Some kid just, for whatever reasons. Yeah, so, um, so if it doesn't work for a student, we always leave our door open, right? We, we also work as a networking um, conduit to other like referral mechanisms. So, you know, if, if a student needs or if a family needs 
uh, additional resources, that's something that we can help provide. And then our door stays open. So let's say that that student, that kid, that 14 year old turns into a 16 year old and then realizes, you know, gosh, I could have really benefited right, from that. Right. Our door is open. So it's a complete voluntary program. If a student, if a kid doesn't want to be involved, they don't have to be. Um, readiness to change is really based on the individual at the end of the day. We all yeah. know that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, when it doesn't work, um, of course it bums us out, but we really put our resources in uh, the families and in the, the, the students that, that want to change. You know, that's really where, where we put our, our efforts. So, so there's a reason why you got involved in this in the first place, not just uh, this, but the whole social justice. What, what, what experience did you have that led you to want to be concerned with vulnerable populations yeah. uh, rather than taking the easy way out and uh, just having a nice, easy life? Sure. <laughs> well, um, you know, I've always felt like voice hasn't been something that's equitable. Uh, not everybody is at the table making decisions. Uh, that includes, you know, minorities, it includes women, it includes, you know, all different, you know, uh, walks mm -hmm. of life. And I think it is our, you know, our, our due diligence and our honor to give voice to the voiceless. That's something I've always really believed in. Okay. Who are some of your role models? Oh, sheesh, I don't want to sound cheesy, but... Jeremiah, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously there, but no. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say, you know, my father has definitely instilled an amazing work ethic in me. Um, Adrian Moore, the founder of Cary, has been a mentor to me for the last 12 years. Uh, Mona Gonzalez is one of my mentors. She's a longtime founding executive director in Austin and really taught me about looking out into the community, not just within your agency and trying right. to, right. you know, cultivate. But, um, but I've had many mentors, including you, Barry. Um, a lot of folks that have come um, intersected into my life and kind of showed me uh, the possibilities. So I appreciate the comment about me. I, that's very kind of you. Um, so you participated in our Certificate in Nonprofit Leadership Management. I remember back then that you weren't sure if you really wanted to go on to management leadership and so forth. What made you change your mind? What, what Was it the program, other experiences? What was it that made you realize that, by God, I got these skills and I ought to put them at the service of society? You know, it's kind of a circular answer in that, you know, we as counselors and Carrie are constantly telling kids what they're capable of, right? We're constantly reminding them to persevere and push their limits and boundaries. So far be it for me to not do that because I'm too scared or too comfortable in one, right. one setting. So I think it was probably um, having been a counselor advising people for so many years to do the thing that I was afraid to do. Um, so yeah, I think it was um, that, that you know not wanting to be a, a hypocrite and then also um, really wanting to take it and run with it so Adrian had really cultivated a, an amazing program but mm -hmm. I saw areas that it could grow and expand and I wanted to sink my teeth into it and run with it so if you were to identify one or two um, particular um, competencies or perspectives that came out of that program what would they be Gosh, there's so much. Um, one of the things that, that I got that I did not expect to get, one of the unintended uh, benefits of the program, uh, the certificate that, that I got to go through with y'all was uh, the networking with other professional individuals that had similar kind of questions as me. We're all kind of on this precipice of leadership. We don't know what to do. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it really took this giant sphere of nonprofit management that seems you know, um, like the elephant, right? That, yep. that you just can't even, how do you eat that? And made it to where it was digestible. We went into, you know, the, the mechanics of it, but also the overarching um, ethics of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think between, um, you know, the, the mechanics and, uh, you know, like the, the board development, the, mm -hmm. the funding mechanisms, the grant writing, all of that gave me the skills. But what really helped me was watching other people in my cohort grow alongside me. So looking back, I know it's only been four years that you've been director, eight years that you've been involved in this. Let's say another uh, younger person, not young, younger, so it's relative, <laughs> uh, would approach you and say, wow, I think what you're doing is fantastic. I'd love to be an executive director. 
What are you going to tell them? Well, I guess it all starts. Not at my agency. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, what are you going to tell them? I think it all starts with your why. You know, um, it's not an easy job. It comes with high stress. Um, stress is inevitable. It's how you manage that stress that really um, inspires the outcomes and helps others around you stay inspired. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if somebody asked me, uh, you know, should I do it? I would ask them why they want to do it, because it's a constant. It's a daily, you know, wake up and this is this is what I do. This is who I am. Um, any advice that I would want to give them would probably start and stop with um, being okay with making mistakes being okay with being vulnerable, being okay with asking for help. Those are all things that I struggled with that it really probably would have been a lot easier had I, had I known that. And um, if, what would you say to the young you um, when you started? Now that you know new things, you know a lot more. Um, yeah, 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 I would say. You're certainly um, much more self-confident than. than <laughs> Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I think just maintaining a self-awareness level, maintaining your relationships outside of work, knowing that while work is everything, you know, in this industry, it is not like something that you just at five o'clock you check out, right? right? So really having the ability, and I don't like the word balance because I don't believe that that exists, but being able to throw all of your energy into you know, the love of your nonprofit and what you're doing, but also saving some for those that you love to sustain who you are, right? So being able to, um, to, to really create and nurture your staff kind of comes from them seeing you being able to do that yourself with your life, so. If we were to interview your staff, not what they'd really say about you, what would you like them to say about you? Oh gosh, I would like for them to say that they felt supported, that anytime they had an idea that, you know, I at least heard them out, um, you know, that, that they knew that they were part of a team, part of a, a bigger, bigger picture. I think oftentimes we feel like we're on an island, the only person, you know, shouting into the abyss, but that, you know, there's a collective yep. um, agenda, a collective impact that we all strive for, and that, um, that I'm, supportive of that that mission and what they really say uh, gosh that i'm just you know it's just i have unreasonable expectations and no i mean i think that they might say that um that that i bring a lot of uh levity to the job i think you have to, to have to have some some fun with it as well absolutely you know and i also um i think uh, being able to to work with the team that I do, I, we've really created an incredible team. It took you know several years. Um, we have a really powerhouse uh, board of directors right now, governing, really involved. We've got an excellent staff. So I would really hope that everyone just felt uh, supported and part of the bigger picture. Great, good answer. Thank you. Uh, so, walk me through. I'm a kid. I, I'm at my first interaction with Carrie. Mm -hmm. Maybe bring back your memories of when you were a counselor. Sure. Okay. What happens? Yeah, so... Give um, me in the view as a sense of what, what, what actually happens, um, what, you know, to affect change. Okay. That's a great question. So um, let's uh, just kind of walk through it. So I'm going to be the student. I've most recently gotten into a fight because a bunch of girls were gossiping about me and my boyfriend didn't like it, threw some blows, got got a referral, got suspended. Well, you're a tough girl, huh? I, I, Yeah, I'm tough in this scenario. And so um, the assistant principals refer, uh, refer me to the CARI program. I meet with the CARI counselor. We kind of talk about what it's going to look like. It's a year-long program. Um, and then I take a parent consent home, tell my family, you know, hey, come sign this, give it back to my counselor, of course. And then I'm being pulled from electives on a weekly basis. Um, and into a group where we're focusing on things like anger management, empathy skills, social skills, how to negotiate, you know, your, you know, if you feel like you've been treated unfairly, how to de-escalate a fight, those types of things. Um, we also eat snacks in there, and as a student, you know, we like snacks. Um, so um, it's a safe place to go as well. So anytime that I'm feeling, um, 
you know, heightened emotions or if I had a really hard weekend because, you know, my family is experiencing homelessness or joblessness or food insecurity. When I come to school that Monday, I know my counselor can help me with various things. So while, yes, what we do is very focused on, you know, an evidence-based model in groups that, that helps kids, um, it really is also just having that one person on campus that they know that they can go to if they're having a tough time. Um, you know, the care counselor for them is their advocate. They go to meetings with them um, on campus, like a, a removal meeting. So let's say I get into a second fight. You know, at that point, they're going to they're going to kick me off campus. So my care counselor is going to come sit by me and make sure that it's not a 60 day, it's a 30 day. You know, because we have supports. Um, you know, I also am able to see a care counselor um, as a student um, individually, as needed. Usually, it's once a week. Uh, there's also opportunities for experiential education, so things like visits to Facebook, um, opening up their perspective, um, exposing them to different types of opportunities, even uh -huh. um, things like Trail of Lights um, that you know we just take for granted in our city. You know, Austin's so uh, community-based, but a bunch, a, a very high percentage of kids that live in the city won't even get to see that and never have seen it. So really just um, being an advocate for, for these kids, giving them opportunities to be successful. Um, and that includes service learning projects. So let's say, um, you know, I'm on the carry caseload now, I've got my carry counselor. Um, you know, we might do a beautification project at the school or we might do, you know, um, like a PSA about bullying that we show the whole campus. Um, and that also really helps the student in this scenario, which is me, um, kind of self-identify as not, you know, the bad kid on campus, but then they become a leader. So, um, so you know, hopefully when um, a student has completed the CARI program, they've gotten, um, you know, 16 CARI groups, at least 10 individual sessions, several parent contacts where we reach out, do case management, home visits. All of this is to help support that student long term. So this isn't an intervention that we're hoping uh, that the outcome is short term, right? That, that we just keep these kids out of the principal's office. Mm -hmm. No, this is a long term um, approach or short term um, intervention to a long term outcome. And that outcome is keeping kids out of that pipeline altogether. So that's something that, we, that we've been evaluating. Do you maintain a relationship with the kid after? Yes, there's a mentoring relationship that, that exists. I mean, I know that um, I still go to high school graduations for kids that I counseled when they were in sixth cool. grade. So, cool. And wh where, where do you start? What age do you start? Um, we, our point of entry is middle school. So uh, sixth grade, about 11, 12 years old, we find that that's just the best time to intervene preventatively with kids. They haven't really carved out all of their paths yet. So you don't go to kids in, in elementary school? and So we did have a program, a pilot program in elementary schools, and um, it's just, you know, our sweet spot when it comes to outcomes, which the outcomes yeah. we're looking at are reduction in serious behaviors. It's really just middle schoolers, yeah, middle school well. and, and high school. We, we currently serve one high school, but um, the, the highest level of impact that we have is on the middle school level. And being a nonprofit, as you know, we have to be very strategic with our resources, find where we make the highest impact, the biggest difference, and really, really drill down there. I could have used you all when I was in kindergarten. I was expelled <laughs> for kicking and biting my teacher. <laughs> no, none of this is a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. So uh, we, have, we have a little time left. Um, what would you say to you know, some of your graduates of the program, or whatever you call them, um, you know, 10 years from now. What do you want them to be like 10 years from now? You know, I would actually um, even flip that and have them, you know, as opposed to me telling them what they want to be, them telling me what they want to be would be way more interesting to me. Um, because at that point, they would have been able to have aspirations, right, to actually breathe some life into their goals. Um, I think a lot of our kids come to us with a predetermined uh, life script that they, they, you know, they think they're either going to end up in a gang or, or in jail or worse. And so 10 years from now, I would love to hear from our students what they want to be, not what I think they should be. Thank you for watching Civil Society, and thank you to ACC-TV for producing this show. You can read more about Shana Fox and the Council on At-Risk Youth 
and view previous episodes at nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society.